Yes, these are serious issues and my play and your play is a sacred contribution to the healing on the planet. You are making a difference on this planet and it is so important. And that is the reason I truly believe of why we are alive. Welcome to the Deja Vu podcast, where we believe that living a life of magic can be the default. Join us each week as we playfully and authentically dive into the mysteries of life and explore what it truly means to be human. From spirituality, wellness, and all things to boo, we don't hold anything back. So without further ado, let's let the magic unfold. I am so excited that I'm about to say the intro for the podcast. Hello, beautiful bluebirds, and welcome back to season three of the Deja Blue podcast. I have taken a hat, and I mean hat, break. Uh, from season two and a lot has happened and I have missed sitting in the golden hands and sharing life uh, with all of you. So to be back here is such a blessing to my heart, my mind, my spirit, to my body and to be able to continue to just journey through life through the podcast with all of you is is truly one of my greatest gifts so I am so 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 happy that we are sitting in the new set of season three of the Deja Blue podcast yay I need one of those buttons that you press that just has like an applause I think actually we have one of those we can figure it out for the next episode but for now yeah <laughs> and today I am joined by Sorella Moore. Sorrel has been on the podcast in season two. We had a conversation, deep one, um, but you were in Iceland at the time. So we did a, a online podcast, but this is the first time that actually Sorrel is sitting in the Deja Blue Golden Hands and we get to dive in deep. But today we're going to do some things a little bit different. Um, we're going to do more so of just like a back and forth conversation, catch up mutual between the two of us, as opposed to the old school style of podcasting, which is where I interview my guest and just ask questions. So we're kind of going to bounce back and forth. And um, also just to give a little bit of context of who Sorrel is, she is a bad being, bitch. <laughs> did you say bad bitch? <laughs> I mean, that is definitely on the top of the list of who Sorrel Amor is. I don't like to define you and label you and place you in a box. However, just personally, how you've shown up in my life is a bad bitch. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Fully un unapologetically expressed. Um, always looking to find the leading edge of her personal style, her expression in the world, her message through her YouTube channel, through different outlets. Um, she's an entrepreneur, um, badass bitch storyteller, um, has uh, shared many, many wisdom codes around building business and finances, um, as well as just basically being a modern day Lara Croft. Oh, sweet. Right? Nice. Has anyone ever called you that before? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, I'm really trying to go with the original thing. I gave her um, a nickname of Relly the other day and she was like, yeah, people have done that. So I shifted it and now it's Rello. Apparently no one's ever called you, you that. You are the OG <laughs> on that. So thank you. So Rello, Lara Croft, welcome to the house. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. It feels very good to be here. Yeah. Sitting in these so hands. Good. In the hands of God. I know. Yes. It's an honor. After the journey that we've gone through together, mm -hmm. the last couple of months specifically, Recently, we've got really close. We've spent like a significant amount of time together. And when we're not together, we're like, eh, I miss you. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a friend? <laughs> or sometimes I don't even text you and I just respond to your text by showing up at your front door. <laughs> That's always preferred. <laughs> While you're on the toilet. Yeah. I'm like, hey! And you're like, Lou, I'm on the toilet. Do you mind? Literally. You could have let me know you were coming. I'm like, or not. Or not. I don't mind. You've seen every aspect of me now. The good, the bad, the ugly. And you love it all. And exactly. I'm here for it. And I love the aspects of you too. Aww. Like all of it. And I think that's such an amazing experience to just know someone fully and still be in awe of them as they are. I think that that is actually truly a sustainable love, an all-encompassing love, when you can actually witness somebody, whether they're high on top of the mountain going, my life is amazing, oh my gosh. Or they're like deep in their sacred shit and like purging from every direction, whether it's physically or uh, metaphorically. And to go, wow, you are still so beautiful just mm -hmm. the way that you are. That is truly a sustainable, long lasting kind of love that I am looking for as the default in my connection. So I'd rather have three people that are close in my life 
that are all encompassing than 300 people that kind of judge you and those shadow emotions start presenting themselves. Yeah. I've recently really shed so much of the need to be a certain way. I don't know why, where it's coming from. I think I've grown up a little bit and gone through some heavy shit in the last few months, years that I just, I would rather filter people out as soon as possible and get rid of them rather than entertain the thought. And then they see an aspect of me that is like not attractive and then they recoil. Nah, see all of it. And if you still want it, cool. If you don't, then I don't want to have you in my life really, or I'll just keep you at a distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and it just brings so much more connection when somebody is, someone is able to be so vulnerable mm-hmm. and you've been so vulnerable and open with me. And it's, it just, it's brought me closer mm-hmm. and the understanding that vulnerability does build a way of connecting on a way deeper level than anything else mm-hmm. has opened up the permission for me to do the same. Mm-hmm. So thanks. So what would you say is like the top three traits that you look for in a long-standing relationship outside of romantic partnership but more so friendship or tribe that you attract Mm -hmm. what would be the top three traits that act as glue that bind you together for the long for the long haul oh what a great question Mm. there's gotta be joy in play I have been in a long life of seriousness for a while now and it's boring so joy and play has to be up there which you do perfectly. Hey, <laughs> la, 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 baby, la, la. <laughs> um, there's got to be depth. And I think the depth comes from seeing every aspect of someone. Mm-hmm. And then freedom. Freedom to allow me to be myself and freedom for you to, for me to allow you to be yourself too. Mm-hmm. Because I don't ever want to feel like I need you. Like I want you to be so free that you ch- get to choose when, you, when you're in contact, when we're in contact. And vice versa. So it's not a clingy relationship because clinginess is not desirable in any aspect of life, I feel. What about you? I feel like those top three things also just apply to romantic partnerships. Yeah, fully. Relationships in general Mm -hmm. of how to be able to actually be next to somebody and be deeply fulfilled and not need even need to say anything in the presence of there's like an ultimate freedom that is born from that space. And I would have to like ripple that back to you. There's multiple things that sort of stem off of what you just said Mm. one being something that I've learned recently is if you want to deliver a message in a potent way this is what Russell Byron does really well is bringing the lightheartedness and the play yes the levity while also simultaneously the ability to dive really really deep into deep nuggets of wisdom and to extract gold but the play and the lightheartedness is what opens the heart and then the wisdom then can be infused because the heart's open. And so it's been a really incredible tool to be able to navigate. It's called quintessence in the Gene Keys, the mm. gift of quintessence, the ability to dive deep into the depth and the extremities of consciousness, but to keep it light and playful and silly because then it creates a level of relatability across the board no matter where you are on, on your journey, mm. whether you're just starting your spiritual journey and your quest to ask deeper questions or whether you've been on this journey and trudging away for the past 10 years and still, you know, holding the shaker and, and, and keeping the timeline of uh, illuminating all aspects of your consciousness. Um, so I would say, yes, definitely. Top three for me. I mean, I feel like you just hit, I don't want to like cop you, but I also would have to <laughs> say that there's so a nice. reason why we're French, right, Dad? <laughs> because we've got very similar things um play is super important lightheartedness silliness life can get super serious and of course there are really serious issues that are happening on the planet but it talks about in the gene keys one of the greatest diseases on the planet is over seriousness that we get up from a to b to c to d whether it's waking up and then going brushing our teeth to then having a shower and then to having our morning drink there's this like pinched serious expression on our face that we are not doing enough or that we should be doing more or whatever the narrative is but actually realizing that if we can infuse those in between moments with a a pep in our step a playfulness a silliness a giggle it's our vibratory state that is our contribution to the collective and so for me that's such an important pillar in my life is play and there's a quote I don't know who the original person that said it was um the creative adult is the child that survived Mm. And they're the people I want to be around. It's like the creative adults, the one, the ones that don't see a blank wall, they see a canvas. Mm-hmm. You know, the ones that that realize, oh, we can go down to the beach and we can throw each other up in the air and do some acro yoga or attempt to 
you know, place the name Acro Yoga on it, but really what I'm doing is flailing myself around in the air with my friend. Um, but like to be in that kind of frequency of play and celebration. And you and Reggie do this really well. Um, I mean this in the best way possible. And let me explain. You both remind me of dogs. And, and what I mean by that... Yes, dog. I love dogs. <laughs> I'm down. It's like when I look at my dog and I'm like, oh my God, you want to and she's like, I don't know why we're happy, but we're happy. And like gets really stoked and reflects it back to me. Because Lily doesn't know why I'm all of a sudden really happy. She doesn't need to know. She just knows that she's down to play. And there are also humans like you and Reggie that I'll turn to and we're like, yeah. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> no idea why I just yeah. randomly pulled that out of the bag, but I did. And you're here for it. <laughs> and so it's that reflection of rippling back and forth, that excitement that emanates off of me that oh, then yeah. ripples and it's in you too in, a, in an authentic way. And then what we do is it's like this slinky effect where it just goes, and it builds up an explosion. And then all of a sudden we just implode and that's it. Yeah. But implode in the best way and I mean, having the yeah, best time ever. Into like a poof of glitter. <laughs> I just want to do, though, because I get the pleasure of spending so much time with you now. And oh my God, it makes me so happy. But I just want to highlight to people how much you play. Because I don't know if people actually realize, like sometimes people infuse a little bit of play in their day. There's just little bit sprinkles here and there. Whereas I've been lucky enough to hang around you and other individuals that are full play. And it's... <laughs> I, it's, I know it's in me. This is my default. It's just that I've hidden it for a while. And so to be around people that consciously, I wanted to be around people that bring out joy and play. Like these are the two main things in my life right now, because I had the seriousness, the over seriousness thing go on for way too long. And I just like the amount of play that you have in your life is I wish people could witness how much there is in every single thing you do from even when you're sitting and you're typing and you're working and then all of a sudden you'll just be like blah, 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 and you just randomly break out into I have no idea what's going on just like infuse a little bit of play or the way that you walk down to the beach or anything like there's always moments of joy it's almost like joy is the default play is the default and then everything else is secondary mm -hmm. and it's become such a pattern and routine and a habit for you that you don't think about it anymore but it's awakening my inner child so much more to the point. I mean, we painted pebbles the other day. We did. It was important. It was so fun. And to see how, how important that was to you and how seriously you took it, but in a playful way, <laughs> it was like, we're going to play right now and we're going to paint pebbles. And we're going to go to the beach and we're going to choose the right pebbles. And then we're going to like the whole spread of everything was laid out. All the paints were ready. And there was our friend Justin was there and painting like you were so encouraging of him as well, of everything he was doing. And of me, of, we're not very, I'm, I can speak for myself. I'm not the best painter, but you were just so excited for us to be part of it. And you were so, so in that moment, you were so childish and innocent. And it was really refreshing because I realized that how few of us are willing to act childish because we're adults and we should not act like this. We need to be very adult. And, but you, you still embrace every aspect of yourself because why would you kill off something that you are because of a few extra years under your belt? That, that, it's wild. So I just wanted to highlight that. Oh. How do you stick with play? Like, why is it so important and how have you been able to retain it so much for, this is a really serious problem, a really serious problem, how few people play. Mm -hmm. Which is a paradox in itself, right? It's a serious problem. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> and, uh, also, just there's a couple of pieces that you uh, said, and I will respond to your question. Um, you talked about, um, you know, I, that you experience over seriousness. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Jinkies, um, I, it talks about, you know, every shadow also has a superpower. So it's not that I am a serious person and you don't have access to the play. It's just one side of the coin. When you can flip it, you can actually have a profound amount of play accessible. So it's really important about the story we're telling ourselves, like, I'm just a serious person. That's just who I am. Well, actually, there's another side of the coin there. Um, over seriousness on the other side of the coin in the jinkies is ecstasy and delight. So what I've been able to witness in you is, is whether it's in your hologenetic profile in the jinkies or not, it's, just, it's an archetype that activates within you, which goes, oh, I can be super serious. But also I've seen you in so much like delight and play. And um, I remember at one moment I was at Burning Man with you and I turned around. And Tarzan was doing a handstand and you, you were on his back 
and they're doing a piggyback. And he just did a handstand while you were on its back. Like, I've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> this guy is doing a handstand while you're on his back and you're both upside down. And it was just a moment, you know, where I just turned around and I was like, that's happening. Cool. <laughs> you know, Those are my weird friends. <laughs> we could be standing there going, oh, I'm so bored. Or we could be doing handstands with, with our friends on our backs. Like, that's also available. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, to go back to your question, I think I've I've also been very blessed. I want to give a little bit of credit to my parents, um, specifically my father in this sense, is that my parents, as I was a child, made toys uh, for a living. I don't know if you know this. Um, and so they basically were Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus. And at Christmas, they would get super busy because they'd make much more toys for the world. Mm-hmm. So they'd go to work and... They had a warehouse um, and in the warehouse was just boxes and boxes and boxes. But they, one of their products was battery powered cars for kids. So I would have a little pink convertible and my brother would have a monster truck and we would go up and down the rows of boxes and we would set traffic lights up and stop signs up and, and I would have like a little like toy violin in the back of my convertible and I would go to my violin concerts in my convertible and I would stop at the lights and wait for the lights to turn green. I would abide by all of the rules. My brother would just roll right through the traffic light and the stop signs, which is very stressful for me back in the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so I was always, always encouraged to be playing as much as possible. And I think it's just also part of my blueprint, um, pun intended, uh, to keep that play alive. And I it got fostered in me at a very young age, like mm. to keep nurturing it. Um, and whenever I get disconnected from play, I don't understand what's the point of being alive. I just don't, I can't buy into the belief that we came to this earth to suffer, wow. that we came to this earth to do things we don't want to do, that we came to this earth to just constantly live in a place of compromise. Like that, disconnects me from the understanding of why we're even here when I'm playing not for a purpose not to get to a certain place but because that reminds me why I even chose to come to this planet in the first place and the second I get disconnected from play and it goes into over seriousness then I stop I stop being connected with the why and when I'm disconnected from the why it's a very sad place to be I don't want to create I don't want to make art I don't want to connect with my friends because I don't know why oh so it's literally my life force energy. It's yeah. the what get keeps me alive in a sense. So, you know, there's a there's there's a choice point, right? We come back from a long car ride and we've we've been in Ojai and we've been on a road trip and we come back to the house. We can A watch Netflix or a movie. We can B sit around and chat. We can C make some food and go to bed early. Right. There's so many different things that we can do. Well, my mind is set up is goes, I want to, I've only got this, this last of, rest of this evening with this constellation of humans. I want to connect, but I want to be able to do something that we can spend hours doing, whether, you know, if it's playing Una, we're having fun, mm-hmm. right? So I was thinking we can either um, play a card game or uh, we can go down to the beach, find some flat rocks mm-hmm. and paint them. And Justin and I have this ongoing thing about um, being otters because otters, um, they have such an incredible essence of play. They have, God made these little flesh pockets in the otter's side, specifically designed for their tools slash family heirloom rocks. What? Yes. So they pull out these rocks and they play with them and they float on the river, on the water, and they go, and they play with their rocks on their chest. What? And then they take their rock and they pop it back in their mm. pocket. And their flesh pocket is specifically designed for their rocks to play with god recognized the importance of play oh my god through the otter and the otter in the animal spirit deck that we pull animal cards from is playfulness and the eternal child and so justin was like every time he sees me he goes like this because he's like let's play and so i thought well if we're otters we need our rocks blue so we went down to the water and got our rocks and painted them blue This is what I'm saying. Like your essence of play is just, it's always there. It's the default. It's what you think about. And a question that I think it's nice to ponder for people is like, when did we lose that play? Because at some point 
it, the child becomes like, oh, you can't act like that anymore. And I don't know what age it is, but by default, somehow it disappears, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. But I just want to echo on that thing about like seriousness. A, the otter thing is the cutest thing I think I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. Oh my gosh. Otters were already great before they float down the river holding hands. They like, hold hands. They mate up. They have their mate. You know? And then they have a pocket with rocks. Come on. <laughs> I love them. Flash pocket for the win. Oh my gosh. God, you're good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the thing about that was really profound of like your why. If you don't have that, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, I will reflect on that because I went through two years of panic attacks over the phobia of death. So every month or so I'd break down for three hours and cry on the floor, not being able to breathe because I was pet petrified of dying. And it was my initiation into understanding that we're all going to die. And it was, I went from this very oblivious kid to realizing, holy shit, life is sh not short. I don't like that expression at all, but it is limited. And since then it's been hyper awareness of how I sp spend my time and I choose to do it now more so than ever just in the presence of friends and laughing and playing mm -hmm. like that is my as much of my time as I can is spent on that mm -hmm. because that's what really is going to matter at the end of everything and to be around you and other individuals that just that's your default <laughs> it's like bringing it out of me and making that a default in me because mm -hmm. I want to be that person I want to be 80 and I want to be playing that's my experience of you. Yeah, That's why I love hanging out with you. You and Reggie. Like it's like oh my gosh, that makes so me... much play. Yeah. I love it. I love it. But I just haven't really had people to do it with because the world is so serious. So when you find a match, it's like, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> All the way. Also, I want to touch on what you talk about around death. Um, I believe that our, um, our capacity to make peace with death is also our capacity in which we are allowing ourselves to live. Mm -hmm. And when we're afraid of death, are we actually really afraid of also fully living or we're not fully allowing ourselves to fully live. And death is such um, a remarkable teacher and something that I'm actually, it's very, very, very present for me right now because I have a very dear friend um, who is, uh, is, is very, very um, injured and um, is on the brink of death. And it really hits home when it's someone so close and it's so personal almost. Um, and since that news presented itself, my hugs are just a little longer. My eye contact is a little stronger. My listening is a lot deeper because nothing is guaranteed. And I think that it's so, it's so, um, easy to go well all I've known is life so I think that I'm immortal <laughs> all I've known is being alive like, I don't remember life before that so I think that this is because it's all I know death is some faraway concept and it happens to people where I see on the news or whatever but it doesn't happen to me mm -hmm. it doesn't happen to my friend mm -hmm. but when it does happen to a friend and all of a sudden it's like vibrant alive like full of life full of love full of gratitude blimp gone yeah. it's like this is so fragile. And the only thing, the only thing that we will be remembered for is not how much money we made. It's not how much material things that we acquired. It is the impact we had on every single person we made contact with. So this individual, how he showed up is exactly what people will remember. And they will tell the stories of, oh my gosh, and he sang happy birthday for me that one time and he looked me dead in the eye and I felt so seen and acknowledged by him. They're the stories that are going to reverberate after the life has actually physically passed and gone on the greatest adventure there is, which is actually transitioning to a different frequency. Um, however, while we're here, what have we got to do, from my perspective, is love and melt anything that is not allowing that love in or out as our sacred responsibility. That's the only thing. Like for me, it's just this coming to this earth plane is to remember how to love and to move through my karmic shit that I have accumulated for many lifetimes that is not love. And so it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's the epic, Walking woman that comes to my house and cleans the house. Love her so deeply and to hug her. And today she said, Blue, I really love your hugs. I said, Yeah, because I really mean them. And she was like, 
it doesn't matter who or what it is. It's recognizing every single person is God wrapped in physical form. And the amount, uh, the way that I love you is the amount of love I let in mm. and is a reminder of what it truly means to be alive and is the only thing that lasts here on this planet after we're gone. Mm. So important. Can you give to the mere mortals <laughs> <laughs> steps? Because sometimes you hear these these expressions of like, oh, okay, play, we... You know, you gave some examples of how to infuse more play, but I really want to give people access to you the way that I've been given access to you because it's really been life-changing for me. So when you say things like love, infuse more love into your life and, and really melt everything else away that isn't, that isn't in the way of that, can you give some tangible ways of what that could look like for people so that they can start to do more of that in their life? Great question. You should be a podcast host <laughs> or just come on the podcast more often. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think first and foremost, we've got to look at what isn't love. And when, say for in a conversation and you say something or you do something, you act a certain way that brings up a reaction within me that is definitely not love, where I can feel my stomach tightening and I can feel my chest feeling hot. I can feel a fire inside of me. I can feel myself, my, my jaw clenching. That's definitely not the frequency of love, right? Ultimately it comes down to two energies. It's either, it's either contracting or it's expanding. It's, it's, um, enrichment or it's, 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 um, detraction from. And, and you can really feel that as well in you your, feel in your it, body. Right? People can like distinguish the two. Or yeah. Tightens up. yeah. Um, first and foremost, I believe that we move through life in a seamless way when we can take full ownership of our response or reaction. Mm. If the second that I feel that contraction, that tension, because you've highlighted and I then blame you or I'm angry at you or I shout at you or I call you a bitch or whatever it is, right, that comes out, what is this doing is, is it's it's feeding the frequency of division. It's freezing the frequency of feeding the frequency of dishonor. Mm. And what I mean by dishonor is that I'm dishonoring you, saying that because you did a certain thing, you made me feel this way. I'm making you wrong and I'm making me right. Therefore, I'm creating an energetic hierarchy and I'm creating a division in a binary experience where there's a right and a wrong and that you are shamed or less than because of certain thing that you did. Mm. Now, when I also blame, I'm dishonoring myself because I'm giving any power away to be able to do anything about it. The second I give power away to do anything about it, oh, well, because you said this. Now, all of a sudden, that part of me, that contraction, the five T's, trust the trigger to teach. It's teaching you an area that is not fully in wholeness. That's why the trigger lies there. So if you're tr trusting the trigger, trigger to teach then actually going, what is this here to teach me? And how can I actually learn to love this part of myself? to come into a place of wholeness and then to have this conversation from a, let me just understand your perspective of why you did what you did as opposed to I'm right and you're wrong. I, there's a hierarchy. I'm feeding the frequency of division mm. and therefore actually love cannot remain there and intimacy cannot be born in a place of binary perspective. Oy, so everyone can relate to being triggered. <laughs> everyone can relate to that feeling of being like, you mother. <laughs> how dare you say that do that whether it's some random instagram troll hating on your post or if it's your beloved that's sitting right in front of you that's triggering the shit out of you we can all relate to that trigger however the people that i have seen that quantumly grow very fast are the ones that take radical ownership for their lives and now this is not to say that what the other person did was out of integrity or what the other person did was not in full honoring either. The sacred boundaries within it. However, it's a recognition of if we can use everything in our life that trigger us as a curriculum mm. to learn more about ourselves, then that is where grace is infused because grace is the space where blame is not present. And that is the other side of dishonor is graciousness and grace. So yes, things and people have done things that have created me to set up boundaries and go, you know what? It's taken me 10 years to clean up the temple space of my heart. Please don't walk in here with your shoes on. Oh, yeah. And I'm not making you, I'm not shaming you, I'm not blaming you, but this is a sacred boundary and I love you. Mm -hmm. Now that's a beautiful sacred difference because now all of a sudden the grace has remained while the boundary is in cap kept in intact while also not shaming and guilting and creating two sides and recognizing there is no sides in a circle mm. 
and we are connected through a circle of a oneness. So that's just one tool is radical ownership for our own emotions, our triggers and our re reactions. Um, that is where is love is infused and grace can remain while simultaneously honoring um, the, the, the experience within the, the, the dynamics. So <clears throat> that's just one place. Another place is um, to make peace with or respect the shadow. Mm. There is a shamanic cycle that happens when we go through life. And the shamanic cycle, whether it's in a plant medicine ceremony or just out in life in general, the greatest ceremony that exists, which is life, is that there's a there's this four-step process. Death, purification, rebirth, integration. So we go through in a death and identity or a belief system that goes, oh my gosh, there's a part of me that's dying right now. Oh, it's that unworthiness that I picked up when I was seven years old when mom and dad left me at school and I felt left alone and oh, I felt so unworthy, but it's dying inside of me. And the only way for it to die is to actually face off with it and go head on with that very emotion. There's a death process. And then we start to purify, purify the narrative that is not in vibrational alignment with our truth, the stories that we've accumulated. We start to purify. Death purification. Then we go through a rebirth. Then we step into a new frequency. Then we step into a new truth of who we actually are, who we've always been since we were born, but we believed a narrative that was actually just slightly two degrees to the right. Then we start going through the rebirth. Then we integrate that on a daily basis in the mundane moments. 80% of our lives, if not more, are made up from mundane moments and how we actually hold ourselves, how we breathe, how we connect with people, how we present ourselves out in the world and also how we present ourselves when no one's watching mm -hmm. is the integration of that rebirth frequency. Now, this is just the cyclic nature of being human. So we're going to go through times of death and we're going to go through times of immense gratitude and bliss and celebration. Can we respect that winter has to happen for summer to also happen. Mm. The leaves have to fall off the tree and the tree becomes bare and kind of ugly almost to then move into a phase where actually it creates a fertile soil for new birth to happen. So to make peace with our sacred shit and to recognize it is all sacred. Yeah. And that, I think, what we talked about before about friendships is realizing if I can love you when you're on your knees bawling your eyes out with your heart completely shattered into a million pieces and just absolutely see the beauty in you in that moment then also I get to receive you at your best as well mm. can we do that for ourselves mm. and if we can do that for ourselves that's when we start to emanate at the frequency of being completely unfuckwithable because I know that I am grief shame sadness Separation, angry, jealousy, as well as creativity, joy, play, silliness, childlike awe and wonder, bliss, beauty, grace, and love. And when I allow all of it to exist and all of it to have a seat at the table, then I truly become an unfuckable human. And that frequency is the frequency of loving all of it, not just bypassing our own sacred shit just to get to the highs and presenting that to the world, but then only being 50% as powerful. There's a few things that, I, uh, that I've learned on the journey of radical self-responsibility for everything that's happened because um, I went through heartbreak eight months ago and I went through a stage that wasn't pretty, that I was, there was a lot of blame and there wasn't a lot of love. And it was like, I was in a pain, man. Because I had lost myself and I allowed myself to be lost in a lot of ways. And I think every relationship you almost try to well, for, my, for me, that, that's been a learning lesson is like a lot of sacrifice in order to make that relationship work and putting that first and just it, getting a little bit off balance. And so when it all ended, I didn't recognize myself anymore. Um, it was, yeah, it was really sad actually. So that's been a rebuilding process for me to figure out who I am, what I stand for, what I love, what I don't love, uh, what excites me, what doesn't excite me, who I want to let him in, into my space but there was also a time where I was, you know, for myself and people very close to me that I wasn't the, at the highest integrity because um, it, there was blame. And I think sharing it with the right people is really important because there's people that can use your shadow against you, which is what you spoke about yesterday. 
And that's not the frequency. You do not want to open yourself up to a lot of those people. Whereas I knew that when I was sharing it with very, very, very select people of the things that I went through and the pain that was caused inside of me that I was projecting that somebody else did to me, I knew that the people witnessing that weren't thinking differently of the person that was involved. They knew it was my process, what I was going through, and it was reflection on me and the stage of healing I was in. I couldn't come straight into love straight, uh, straight away. It took me a minute and it's so nice knowing that the people that I shared this stuff with, yeah, they they held the space and now I'm coming back around and being like, because I start, okay, my, my stages of healing where there was blame and now I'm at a stage where I'm taking self, radical self-responsibility for what happened and looking at that stage being like, oh, I did so much of the damage. And if I'm t- taking full responsibility, like full, I can say that I did the, I did the damage, like actions that I did that led to this, that, that then led to a result of that. And now I'm coming back around and thinking, saying, holy crap, that person is beautiful. It just wasn't a match anymore. And that's such a nice place to come to. Um, and I think if, if in the healing journey, if everybody can take full responsibility for me, I know now that that means I'm going to go, on the biggest transformational journey because I will never let that Sorel come back into the space and I'll never let her um, be present because I, I just don't want to repeat that journey. I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to leave someone worse off than when they found me. I want to nurture that, especially if they're close to me. Um, and I just wanted to also throw in that piece where you said, you know, witness, witnessing people in their shadows, that happens and should be embraced when, people aren't projecting their shadow at you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although, you know, I've had it with my family, very close relationships in my own family where they've projected at me and I've gotten to the point where I'm becoming more unfuck withable that when that was being projected at me and blamed and you're a piece of shit and you're pathetic this, I don't even like you. I was like, this is not mine. Mm-hmm. And I knew that and I witnessed and I loved that beyond what they were saying, but it wasn't mine. That's only... When people are projecting on you like that, that's a limited capacity for who you're going to let into your space to do that. But if someone can be in their shadow and not throw it at you, that's a different space. If you're in your shadow and you're just grieving because you're grieving and not blaming anyone for it, that's a whole different story there. And that that very piece that you're mentioning is where the boundary sets up, right? Of going, hey, we're not here just to accept and 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 be in the unconditional loving of every single thing that is presented mm-hmm. recognizing i can dance with be with fuck with those individuals <laughs> that are taking radical responsibility of their experience and in what that looks like when we go back to like the the, the friendships slash partnerships we choose to be around is that there must be a pillar of the temple a found a, a basic foundation of taking responsibility for our own responses slash reactions so that is where the boundary presents itself in the sense of the people that we choose to spend our most time with whether it's um romantic partnerships friendships for me a basic need and i use the word need very little um but in this sense yes a basic need is that for those individuals that are taking radical responsibility of how they're choosing to respond if it becomes a projection field, you've got really not that much to work with. And that's where a boundary needs to come into place. Mm-hmm. The second I'm going, you're a bitch, you're this, you're that. What have we got to do to work with here? Again, that's the frequency of dishonor and that's where the boundary needs to come into place. And so to have that as a basic need within romantic partnership, also within direct friendships of going, are these individuals willing to take ownership for how they're responding and reacting to the experience or are they choosing to blame everyone else for why they are the way that they Mm. are and so whether it's family or whether it's friends or whether it's a beloved this is where a boundary needs to get put in place of recognizing we cannot move forward Mm -hmm. until everyone is willing to take responsibility for how they are choosing to respond to the situation yes and so that's also we'll see you know with a lot of people that I've just started to notice that the younger generations are coming through with an awareness that the older generations did not have or had to have the environment to support that. So how we, how a lot of our parents have chosen to respond or react to certain things, the younger generations are going, no, 
Like, I'm not actually okay with that. Like, this is not my truth. And I'm going to have to draw a sacred boundary around how much interaction we have until you're willing to actually stop projecting onto me and to have a conversation where we're actually birthing intimacy because we're taking ownership of our sides as opposed to creating a projection field and making someone less than and just to carry the shame for the next generation to come. Because it's our responsibility to actually say no so that we don't pass this on to our children and what they got from their mother and their mother mm. and their mother or their father and their father isn't continuing on to the next generation when we have children and then all of a sudden the child acts a certain way that we don't like and then we shame and guilt them for it and then it goes on and on and on until someone is actually willing to say no. And yeah. I love you. Yes. This is where it gets a little tricky for me though because I have a, my, my dad, he's also very much in victim mentality of like, this happened to me and, and projecting that way. Um, and I've said no, and I've got my boundaries now, but then I question, is that meant to be a really deep teacher for me? What have I not learned? Why can't I get through to his heart? Which is, you know, for a forever question that I've been dealing with. I have not been able to connect with him and he hasn't, he doesn't really let people in because I feel like he's really, really hurt and he's misunderstood and he doesn't know how to Communicate, which is another side note that I want to say. I've now been really focusing on communication and learning how to effectively communicate. And if I can just throw out nonviolent communication as a book, to, as a starting point, to you just know the author. I don't know the author. Nonviolent communication. It's a like big movement, but it's it's your words are spells, which you talk about so often. And if you don't know how to effectively communicate to people of what your desires are tapping into what you desire, which is something that so many of us have been taught to ignore. We don't, so many of us don't know what we want. And I went through this stage recently. I was like, I don't even know what I want. I don't even know what I desire because that's been shunned and everybody else's needs were put in front of me. And now, so this communication is like voice your desires, not needing somebody else to respond with saying yes to your desire, but at least you voice what you want. And then maybe there's room for working together like I desire to mend the relationship with my father, but I don't know how because he's not willing to come from this other side and effectively communicate with me. Rather, he just projects. And he, I know he wants to connect so badly, but he just has no, no tools. So it feels like he's choking on his own words. Um, but that's my question then. Okay, boundaries are great, but then you're still missing out on some friendships and relationships that you wish you could have. I mean, I think this stems for a lot of people, other people in my life that are so close that I'd love to connect with so much deeper, but they are unwilling to meet in that space. So it's always limited. <laughs> yeah. Where in your life do you feel like you're choked from your truth? Uh, <laughs> what you're trying to say is that everything is a reflection of... Not necessarily okay. a direct reflection. Yeah. Uh, however, I find that when I ask that question, a deeper level of compassion is born. And when that compassion is infiltrated into the relationship, then it starts to melt like butter and res uh, resolutions start to be formed. Mm. And so I've noticed within our friendship, um, there's been certain things that have stemmed up that go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I could not speak my truth in this moment. And I felt choked of my truth. And that is a highlight of things that, that uh, didn't start with us, but do have the opportunity to end with us. And they show up as trigger experiences in our life because they're triggering a deeper thing that we've inherited that wants to be healed. Mm. Yes, this is true. I've got to sit with that one for a while. Huh? I've got to sit with that one for a while because it would be nice to repair some relationships while still having boundaries. I guess coming from a loving space mm -hmm. in communication and allowing the other person to also make a choice if they want to participate in the healing of the space mm -hmm. whilst you do your own healing and see if it melts the walls between this connection. Mm. How would you say that you um, have been working with people pleaser energy? Oh, girl. Yes, people pleaser has been very, very strong in my life, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around male relationships mm -hmm. because of where it stems from, early childhood trauma, <laughs> for sure, of needing to put everybody else's needs in front of mine because it actually meant danger. It wasn't just, oh, because it actually was danger. 
It's like a survival mechanism. It was survival. So I've been slowly shedding this, but it definitely still comes up when it comes to male relationships because I still subconsciously believe that their their way is more important than mine. And it was reflected even recently. I put this on Instagram, so I'm willing to share it again. But I couldn't voice my needs when it came to being intimate with someone I didn't even want to be intimate with. They expressed their desire to be intimate and I choked and I was like, uh, 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 okay. And then it just kept being pushed. And eventually, finally, before it got too much, I said, oh, maybe next time. But I was, it was so weird for me to witness myself in the space of I can't say no to a male that I don't want to be in the presence of in the intimate sense. That was shocking to me. So, yeah, the people pleaser energy is strong. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like um, how can we truly love ourselves when we can't trust ourselves? like fully to the capacity of like, if I can't trust my own word to be rooted from a place of my actual truth, mm. how can I love myself if, if I can't fully trust myself? And that capacity to also let love in and to align ourselves with the part that we're truly calling in or those individuals that we really align with is, <clears throat> oh, there's an exploration here for me of going, oh, there's a deeper level of self-love that's available. Mm. And it's based off of, can I trust my own word? And to stand in the presence of a powerful, in my experience, like I've had very, very powerful men on the podcast, spiritual leaders that are like leading edge of what it is that they do. And I've noticed in their presence, I like shrink and I get nervous and I trip over my words and I get super in my head because subconsciously I place them higher than myself, more powerful than myself, wiser than myself, got something more figured out than I do, pedestaling them, making myself less than. And it's like, wait, where did this even stem from? Mm -hmm. And how can I actually start to renegotiate and rewrite my relationship with hierarchying somebody in the patriarchy of the contract of my own mind? How can I deconstruct the patriarchy of my own mind first and foremost so that I can actually start to learn to love myself in the presence of powerful beings as a reflection of the power that I have within Mm. as opposed to outsourcing my power, shutting my voice down and continuing to perpetuate the people pleaser energy in me which then will be passed on. Anything that is unresolved will be passed on to my children, my future children. So there's a sacred responsibility of once it gets highlighted, it can be really confronting but also it's an amazing opportunity for a deeper level of healing. Mm. And so just this, this this recent thing that you shared that I feel like probably so many women can relate to, and it's a really big movement that's happening on the planet right now, is where in our own personal lives is our truth <laughs> shut down, repressed, can't express, afraid of how it's going to be presented, don't want to upset the other person, but actually we're suffering in silence because we don't even know what it likes like to feel like to trust our own truth anymore or to to be able to be in our fullest expression and, and to accept that part of ourselves as well. And we're seeing this just like collectively in a very real conversation just on the collective scale around what the movement's happening in Iran right now. And if you're not familiar with what's happening in Iran, it's a very ripe conversation. Um, there was a 22-year-old woman that was not wearing her hijab correctly and there is what's called the morality police out there where they are checking on women and making sure that their hijabs are being worn correctly and they're fully covered up, covering their hair and making sure that the only thing that you can see is their eyes. Now, this woman was not wearing her hijab correctly and the morality police um, uh, arrested her and while she was detained, she was beaten and she died. Um, so she's beaten to death. Now, this was the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back and created a massive uprising. Now, before the revolution happened, this wasn't the case in in Iran. Since the revolution, this is when everything shifted and changed and there was a massive suppression and oppression of the women's voices Mm -hmm. to the point where they're not legally allowed to sing in public. They're not allowed to go to musical concerts. They're not allowed to show their hair. Like it is a crazy amount of suppression that we're seeing. And of course we live in LA, you know, we have this podcast, we can talk about whatever we want. We get our titties out. We can literally get our titties out. All the time. And not be stoned, literally stoned. Yeah. Legally allowed to have rocks thrown at you in a public place if you disobey your father. It's, it's. There's it, literally we are sharing the same planet, and yet the polarity of what's happening and the imbalance of the 
of the female voice that is happening. And yet it's still actually happening to a degree inside of us on a much more liberated version. But also as you heal this piece, this specific piece that you mentioned, we're also vibrationally healing the suppression of the female voice on the planet. And so right now what Deepak Chopra talked about is that we're going through a paradigm shift where if we actually just not let's look about female and male, but we're looking at masculine and feminine energies, there is a massive imbalance of the masculine and the feminine, which is societal's projection of, well, you must do more, you must hustle, you must work harder, go penetrate, go, go make it happen, go yeah. hustle. But the feminine principle is to align, align your vibration, to magnetize, to listen, to soften, to nurture, to create. Now, we can see with the wars that are happening on the planet when the masculine and the feminine is out of balance, how we choose to actually move forward in life is by dominating mm -hmm. and by creating wars and fighting against each other. So if this is really out of balance, we have to go through a paradigm shift. And sometimes, as we know, the only way to resolve is to go through the shadow, is to go through the 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 thing that is the rotten at the foundation, we've got to face off with it. So right now we're seeing, and unfortunately not seeing, because the media aren't covering, covering a lot of it, and also the internet has been shut down in Iran. So women can't take to their social medias. We can't become the media because it's completely shut down. So they're basically murdering in silence right now. And these women are taking to the streets and risking in their lives because they're saying, you know what? It, it's worth risking my life because I've got nothing to live for if we're going to continue to live like this. Shit, the bravery that comes from that, this scares me so much. And there's so many different puzzle pieces to, to it. One, I'm so thankful that we're going through this giant shift um, that is completely necessary. I am going through this in a, on a very obviously minor scale. I, I remember someone saying to me, can we achieve world peace? And instantly I was like, of course not. If we can't have peace within, we can't have peace without, like outside. And I feel like it's almost, for me, it's almost the same thing when it comes to this feminine and masculine energy. And sometimes I think people find this quite a selfish way of doing things. If you work on yourself, then you're actually hel helping the world. But I, I really see this to be true because I used to disown the feminine energy so much to the point where I thought anything delicate, like you'd never see me wearing things like this. You'd never see me delicate. I feel very delicate and sensual and feminine you'd never see me doing any of these things because I, I thought it was pathetic. And if I have that frequency going out into the world about women and them dressing up too much, oh, they just want attention. Why are they dressing up like this? What's wrong with them? Like that is going to affect my circle of people, especially with my audience. That's going to affect a lot of people. So I've been very publicly talking about my rebalancing of the energies because I was so rude and disgusting how much I judged women and I'm a fucking woman mm. and I did that so for me to now come back into balance and actually start to see that the feminine energy is exactly what the world needs right now so desperately because I also come back for, come from a background of being a workaholic everything in my life was work finances money everything there was no room for play there was no room for joy for community none of it there was no space mm. and it was rotten and if I died in that moment and I remember now death is like a like a because I went through this weird relationship with it death is now my compass so I know if I'm on track or on off track or off track and if I was to ask myself if I died now would I be satisfied absolutely not because there was such a gaping hole relationship with my family was shit so many things was shit but now if I was to die now would I be happy yeah I've done it's not about what I've done it's how I show up in the world and so the balance is coming back and I really do think that the world really needs the softness we we don't want there's just such a different way of operating in the world that we don't know yet what it looks like but I know that it means respecting to the highest degree what women have, just because you can't put a monetary value on what a woman is, or the feminine energy is allowed, to, uh, brings out, which is the nurture, the caring, even the chaos. I want to highlight like sacred rage is a real thing because when sacred rage comes up, it means that something's really out of balance and the feminine intuition can pinpoint what that is. And that's worth gold. 
to align back to what is real and what is integrity, like that's also part of the feminine energy. And that's what's happening in Iran right now. That's why there is this rage, it's anger. It's not feminine energy, soft and delicate all the time. No, mm -hmm. it will fuck shit up if you are not in alignment and we are not in alignment right now. And I, I honestly, I, I can't even imagine risking, it sounds so sad. I don't know what it's like to even put your life on, on the line for something like this. And I also wish I was brave enough to stand with these sisters to do what they're doing. Mm. Because I mean, I'm born, I've been born in great countries where I honestly have th thought to myself, if I was born in the Middle East, I would have been dead a long time ago. And for them to be living in a space where they've been choking so much on their words that they couldn't even sing in public. There's a movement that's happening um, within the, the bigger movement. Um, and it's it, it's going along the lines of, for every time we've had to dot, dot, dot. Mm. So we stand here for every time we've had to look at our shoes because we'll be beaten for looking you in the eyes. We do this for every time we've had to take a pill because our mental health is taking a massive toll around the level of suppression. And the reason why I know this is because I did an Instagram live and it was just really just sort of out of the blue and also perfectly timed was I was doing an Instagram live. I felt that there was this was an important topic, but I didn't know enough about it to make the whole Instagram live about this conversation. But I mentioned it briefly throughout the live. There was a sister that joined and she said, I'm in Iran right now. I'm in the capital. I'm going to follow her of your blue, yours blue and I'm here because my friend um, is a, a computer wizard and has set up a private IP account so I have access to the internet. So my followers started like, wow, oh my gosh, Blue, can you bring her on to the live? So I asked if she joined the live and she accepted. She jumped on the live and she had to cover her face to keep her privacy protected and um, to keep make sure that she was safe. And when I saw the look in her eyes, and I felt the vibration of her voice. All of a sudden it became really personal. I saw my mother, I saw my grandmother, I saw my daughter, I saw my friends that are from the Middle East. Um, I felt that this isn't just an issue of the women in Iran. This is a global human rights conversation. And it is really important to keep it alive for those that have the platform and the, the ability to actually share um, and not, are not going to be killed for it, mm -hmm. to be able to support and be the voice for these women. Um, and she ended up giving me her personal information and we WhatsApp every single day and she gives me updates of what's happening every day. And she's like, we go to bed at night hearing gunshots in the streets. Um, she's almost been arrested multiple times. She... Um, she feels emotionally completely depleted. Like she's just on her last legs emotionally because you're constantly in fight or flight mode. And I, you know, sometimes we just chat about things outside of what's going on as well. And I would like, yeah, I watched this person live in concert the other day. It was so profound. She's like, I've never been to a concert before. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, we're not allowed legally. Women are not allowed to go and watch concerts what like I'm learning this stuff that I had no idea about it's so easy for me to be in my bubble of my privilege of what I get to have access to and surrounded by those also that have that access but by being friends with this sister and her having the courage to break the law and to share her wisdom with me and to share what is actually happening and to share a little bit of her life I'm allowing, it's allowing me to get out of my privilege bubble and to actually, to utilize these platforms to, to have this conversation, mm. to share these things. And so I think ultimately there's multiple things in which we can do once this awareness is brought to us, we can utilize our platforms, whether we have 10 followers or we have 10,000 followers or 10 million followers, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's also that. And then there's, there's also a recognition of where in my life am I suppressing my own truth? Yes. Right. So like what we talked about here before, and that's why I asked you that question, where do you feel gagged by your own truth? Because own, we can see it in others. We can see it in our father or in our mother or in our grandparents or whatever. And the only thing that we can truly heal, we can't heal other people for them. We can't go inside of other people's experience and do the healing for them. We can ask ourselves the deeper question of where did I suppress my truth and how did I feed into the frequency of people pleasing when I was in the presence of this this man that I then shut down my truth because that vibrational essence that 
experience is contributing to the imbalance that we're seeing outside of ourselves. And what you just said is, well, how can I heal the world if this part is still alive within myself? Well, there's a sacred responsibility once it becomes into our awareness that we have something we have we have something to work with and we have a curriculum to start to transmute out of our bodies, um, whether it got passed on from our mother or our father or how it, it was born within us when we were children, how we inherited it. And then outside of that, how can we be a voice for those that do not have a platform and a voice right now? So there's multiple things that we can do. And there's this, this frequency called divine dissatisfaction where we look at the world and go, oh my God, there is so much going on whether it's the devastation of what's happening in Puerto Rico right now with um, with the natural disasters and the people that have become homeless, or if it's in Tampa or in Florida with what happened with Hurricane Ian, or whether it's the children that are stuck at the borders, or if it's, you know, what's happening in Iran. It, there's so much that we can sit there and just be like, I will never, ever, until the day that I take my last breath, stop being in divine dissatisfaction, and there's always more what we can do. Mm -hmm while simultaneously focusing on, well, this is one thing I can do. And if I can just improve one corner of the earth, if I can just, Mother Teresa says, if I can't feed a thousand miles and just feed one, that's something. And I don't know who originally said this quote, but um, there's, not, there's not much that I can one person do, says eight billion people. Yeah. And I do really, I truly so strongly believe in healing of the self. Like if you can't feed, if you can't heal the world of the trauma, yeah, healing yourself of the trauma. And so facing off with the questions of like, where did I choke on my own truth? It's like, that means you're healing yourself. You're one of the 8 billion people. If we all did the work and faced off with these sides of ourselves, with our shadows, with um, labels that were given to us that are not true and we still hang on to them, mm -hmm. um, with having pulled on the persona so strongly of seriousness rather than like there is so much going on in the world and I still have a responsibility to figure out how to vibrate really high because that's actually what's really changing the world mm -hmm. on such a level because how many people do we in interact on a daily basis that are playful and fun and joyful and it changes our mood instantly. It's like, whoa. So if we can be that in the world, like you're changing so much just by being thankful for being alive, grateful for being alive. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that we can do on an individual level and it's not a selfish thing. And that gives, that overflows your cup then to also give out to the rest. Peter Crone mentioned this like multiple times, or maybe he mentioned it once and I've mentioned it multiple mm -hmm. times, <laughs> is that our vibratory state is our contribution to the collective. Mm -hmm. That comes back to the original point of what we talked about with over-seriousness and that permanently pinched expression and that life is so serious and there's no time to play from a lens of sarcasm. Yeah, that's exactly what the world needs right now is more seriousness. It's definitely not what the world needs is more play and lightheartedness. How dare you play? How dare you be joyful? There's so many people suffering. That is so backwards. Yes, these are serious issues and my play and your play is a sacred contribution to the healing on the planet. And if you can dance while the sun is setting or sit in prayer and say 10 things you're grateful for and make your bed with a pep in your step and excitement of a rush for a new day, you are making a difference on this planet. And it is so important. And that is the reason I truly believe of why we are alive. And when we, like I said before, when we get disconnected from our play, even if we're in the middle of a revolution and we get disconnected from our play, we get disconnected from the reason of why we're here. Ding. Thanks for coming on the podcast today, Sarah. That was the best. I loved it. It was so fulfilling and joyful. And we touched on so many amazing topics. So many different things. And it's so funny because right at the beginning when we sat down to talk about what we were going to talk about, we didn't actually really cover any of those things. Nope. <laughs> and we just let it flow naturally and covering off really, really, really important and mm -hmm. uh, alive moments that are happening around in our own lives and in the world. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Thank and you. And that's why I say this prayer at the beginning, right? Because once the prayer, so before we started filming, I like to do a prayer specifically as we're opening up the new season um, and set some intentions. And ultimately what the intention is, is that we 
we trust that whatever comes through us is through the frequency of our heart and not touching our mind. And as opposed to planning, because that lives in the mind, is actually what is the medicine of the moment or that which is needed, which is what flows out. And so trusting in that. And and so there is no planning that one can do when we live in the moment of a deep level of listening. And so it's so fun to see where it wants to go while also trusting that the intentions have been set and this prayer has been placed. And then what unfolds is sort of up to uh, divine intervention at that point. Presence is the gift of God. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorrel, for those that are listening to this podcast and they're like, wow, she's dope. I want to continue to follow her and just like be able to stay in touch with whatever it is that you're creating and you're offering and you're doing in the world. How do people find you? I am on every single platform at Sorel Amor. You'll find me there. I am having a mini break from working and just being now. So that's exciting as well. And wherever that evolves is great. Um, But that is where you'll find me on the platforms. You mastered the art of your human being a human doing. Yes. But now you're learning how to be a human being. And it's so much more fulfilling. <laughs> I love it. Nothing. You're good at it. There's no money that could buy the experiences that I'm having by learning to listen and being present and being a human being. Oh. <laughs> yeah, shimmy shimmy. <laughs> Amazing. Well, if you resonate with this podcast episode and um, you would like to be a part of being able to spread this message in a good way, recognizing this message is not about me or about Sorrel, but more so about the frequency of the message itself, and you feel like it could touch, illuminate, and open the hearts of others, then feel free to share it on your Instagram stories um, to tag both myself at Blue of Earth and at Sorel Amor um, on Instagram and um, also at Deja Blue Podcast and to recognize that we can only reach so many people but when we all utilize our platforms to spread a message in a good way we can reach many, many, many more people. Um, and also if you feel called that you want to share it with a friend then copy the link and send it over and maybe that it can support and illuminate another. So thank you so much for being here and also recognizing when I say welcome bluebirds I'm talking about not my birds, but blue represents beauty, love, and unity. So it's a recognition of a responsibility of spreading beauty, love, and unity through the world, through your essence, and through your presence. So thank you so much for being here. May beauty, love, and unity continue to be restored on this earth so that we leave this planet way more beautiful than we found it through every breath and every step. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time. (laughs) 